Right, we're going to talk about risk prioritization and the evolution of pen testing. So there's a lot to cover, I'm going to cram into 15 minutes, possibly too much, but we'll, we'll, we'll plow ahead. Um, just a quick bio on myself, my name is Raheem Gina, uh, so I'm the co-founder um, and COO of EdgeScan. EdgeScan, uh, I suppose personally, I have uh, you know, 20 years in cybersecurity, um, most of my career is a penetration tester. Um, EdgeScan, we look for vulnerabilities, so we're full stack, we look at the application layer, network layer, a bit of attack surface management thrown in there, um, but that's, that's us, that's our bag. So, penetration testing, the old way. So, how did people used to do this stuff? So, I suppose 20 years ago, we used to, um, you know, we used to have to try and convince people why we would do penetration testing. Um, and that's obviously changed a lot. Um, for some reason in compliance and stuff, it's come in that we'll do a penetration test once a year. Uh, a lot of policies and stuff have sort of come into that mantra. And that was okay when we were waterfall and we would have, you know, um, you know, maybe one major release a year and that kind of stuff. So there's many reasons why that's no good anymore and some people are still doing this, uh, a lot of people are not doing it. So why doesn't it work? Well, the way we develop code now is totally different to how we used to do it. So there's obviously the move to agile and people pushing code very, very frequently. Um, you know, that's just, uh, your exposure window then is too high. So we'll release some code and then, you know, next week it's, the landscape has changed. Uh, we, we could be introducing vulnerabilities at that point. Likewise, even if the application, if we're not pushing code, the platform it sits on is, is, always, uh, is always changing. If you think, you know, patch, uh, patch Tuesdays, the known vulnerabilities in the OS, the platform, all that stuff, the landscape the application is on is always changing, so we always need to keep rise and keep, keep pace with that change. Then there was the test exclusions piece as well. That was always interesting back in the day. You'd find a, 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 an issue and you'd be told that's out of scope, that IP is out of scope, that functionality is out of scope, this is a legacy system. Uh, we don't use that anymore, but the, the, the bottom line is, you know, hackers really don't care. They'll find a way in and that's it. Um, so we need to just move with the, with the times. So finding vulner vulnerabilities is easy. Well, it turns out it's not. Uh, if it was, we wouldn't have all the breaches we have today. We wouldn't have the, I suppose, an increase of, uh, of breaches and attacks that we see. It really isn't easy. Um, and there's two really hard questions. They're easy questions or hard answers. Uh, can you honestly answer what is the current state of my vulnerabilities at this time? Do I know what my attack, my vulnerability surface looks like at this given moment? It's a really hard question to answer. And that flips into then, how do I prioritize my limited resources? Uh, obviously, resources, everyone has limited you know, budget, be it people, and especially the, 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 the manpower, uh, people power, et cetera, to, to be able to tackle these things. That brings us into what a modern, I suppose, penetration testing paradigm uh, methodology or approach should look like, I think. So it needs to be thorough. We need to be able to make sure we're testing everything. So we need to be looking at full stack, so application and network. We need to make sure, say in the case of an application, are we crawling every part of the application properly? Uh, are we looking at the authenticated parts? Uh, we need to be, make sure we, we, we find all the bits to then to be able to test. So it has to be thorough. It has to be frequent. Uh, one, the one-off pen test a year doesn't really work. We have to keep pace with that. What does that mean? That could mean continuous. A lot of people use that word. It's just a product, really, of how long the, the, the function of the, the actual test takes. So that could be a week, could be a month. Uh, typically, monthly, I think, is, is usually about right, because people sort of have processes built up around patching is monthly, so we're looking for vulnerabilities monthly, and we're fixing vulnerabilities monthly. Uh, it could be more than that. So high frequency, though, it has to be. Accurate. Uh, I don't know any other industry where you can pay an expensive consultant to do a bunch of tests, uh, give you a nice report output, and, and half of that output could actually be false, could be full of false positives. I don't know any other industry that would tolerate that sort of stuff, but for some reason it's okay in our industry. Um, but ultimately it does need to be accurate. And then it has to be scalable. So 20 years ago, we could have had thorough, we could have had accurate. Frequency, we could have paid for if we wanted to, but from a budgetary standpoint, um, manpower, everything else, the, the solution has to be scalable. We have to be able to meet this, and we have to be able to afford it as well. 
So how do we go about doing this? Well, visibility is a key part of this. This is the bit that you do before you even start looking for vulnerabilities. Uh, visibility um, called attack surface management is the, the buzzwords. Uh, this is something we actually had built in EdgeScan from day one because it just makes sense to us, and then it became its own industry. Uh, other vendors started to sort of productize it separately. But here we're really talking about two sort of things. It's the known and the unknown. So the known is the bit that I have my I don't know, five data centers with my bunches of IPs, my couple of hundred apps. Uh, I need to be scanning, testing, looking for what IPs are live, uh, services that are running, that kind of stuff. I need to know where to even start to look for vulnerabilities. I need to know what my stuff is. The unknown piece then is different than, I suppose, is the bit that we don't know about. And there's a massive piece there as well. Uh, if you think about cloud providers and all that stuff, People are spinning up ephemeral IPs with different services and all this sort of stuff. You don't necessarily know in advance what they're going to be, so you have to, you have to find, use other ways. Uh, the plumbing of the internet and DNS and other methods to find uh, the unknown piece. So once we know what we have, then we can actually start looking for vulnerabilities. Um, so this needs to be full stacks. We need to be testing application uh, or application scanners. We need to be doing network scanning. We need to be you know, looking for known vulnerabilities uh, in the platforms. We need to be looking for security misconfigurations and APIs as well, which is sometimes lumped in with web applications, but are actually very different from a testing standpoint. You have to do that. So this has to be continuous or high frequency, definitely, to be able to keep pace of the change of the landscape that we have. Also has to be validated. We can't just spew out a bunch of false positives anymore. Um, the idea there is to keep it as accurate as possible, validate. Now, what does validation mean? It can be, mean a combination of, of automation uh, or humans. I'm not going to say AI, because I have a thing against AI at the moment, but that's a separate conversation. Um, and then the cherry on the top is the PTAS bit, or penetration testing as we used to call it. Now it's called penetration testing as a service. Uh, pretty much take anything that you had and just throw in as a service at the end. Um, but anyway, it's still pen testing. And what does that mean? That means humans and people. Um, you need people who think like hackers to be able to hack systems, software designed by people. Um, we're not there with AI yet. We're far off it. I've seen AI struggle to spell. So I don't know about the nuances of uh, complex um, vulnerabilities and business logic and things like that. By all means, with automation, I think we need to leverage as much automation as possible. This is the scalable piece where we try and make it as functional as possible for people so, so they can focus their efforts on the bits that people really need to do and use automation to sort of support that uh, to be able to test stuff like business logic vulnerabilities, authorization issues, complex authentication workflows, all that kind of stuff. We need the humans for that. Consequently, uh, I randomly, I, I asked AI to do a, a real-life picture of AI doing a pen test, and this was the best it could come up with. So I don't know how real-life that is. I really tried to plug the real-life bit, but um, so I think we're still a little bit off from AI from doing a, a penetration test. So I'm going to pivot into risk for a little bit for the end of this. Risk is a human concept. Uh, it's a measure of how bad something can be. It's very intuitive. Um, you know, how bad, uh, what's the likelihood of something bad happening versus, well, you know, what's, how bad is it going to be, the impact, if it happens. How do you guys measure risk? How do we all measure risk in this? We use this little guy, the uh, Common Vulnerability Scoring System. Um, so, I suppose, uh, probably my feelings on CVSS might be known here, but for some reason over the past, a high or critical risk, or a higher critical CVSS score has been equated to higher critical risk. Um, and I think that's all mixed up uh, for a number of reasons. So, um, but, but that's what policies, uh, internal organizations say. That's what, um, you know, there's just, there's too many high and critical risk scored CVSS scores for it to be useful. They're, everything is high. And when everything's high and critical, nothing's high and critical. So using CVSS to try and determine where to focus your resources is, I think, really challenging. And I'll go as far as to say as I think CVSS only has been responsible for focusing sort of the wrong focus for people on fixing the wrong stuff. Uh, and consequently, probably has made things maybe not as good as they could have been. Uh, if not a little bit worse. How do we tackle that? Well, there's a number of different dynamic options here. EPSS is probably one of my favorites. This is not us. This is first.org. Uh, this is the exploit prediction scoring system. And it's basically a percentage of how likely is a CVE, so it's a known vulnerability that's found, 
how likely is it to be uh, exploited in the next month? Um, so the thing I like about this is it's an open model. You can go and you can query it. You can see how they do it. You can send them mails. You can challenge them. You can ask them, why have you thought of this? And they'll say back something else. And it's, 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 it's sort of an open book. And I'm, I'm a big fan of that. The idea here is that less than 5% of CVEs are actually exploited in the wild. So this is taken from their website. So if we see the, the large circle is the, the, the number of published uh, CVEs, say, in a given month. If you, like most organizations, have a policy that you must fix high and critical risk issues within five days, 10 days, one month, that would be the blue, the blue box, the blue bubble there uh, with a CVSS score of seven or above. Uh, however, in practice, you find that actually the number of exploitable or exploited CVEs is the red bubble, the smaller one. So we are, yes, fixing some of them, but we're also missing a load as well. But then we look at all the other extra work we've done if we've actually fixed all the rest of the blue there when at that time when we maybe didn't need to do so. Another item to add to this as well, which is very useful, is the CISA Kev, uh, the Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency in the US. They have a, um, they, anytime a known vulnerability has been exploited in the wild, in a federal agency or a government or a public body, that kind of stuff, they add it to this list. So it's a Boolean value. Has it been exploited? Yes or no. And you can query all this stuff yourself. It's all publicly available. So all this feeds into risk prioritization. So obviously here at EdgeGAN, we, we find vulnerabilities. That's our, that's our thing. Every year we take a, we do a sort of an analytics on our sort of vulnerability database and we tease out trends and different things like that. We produce a statistics report. Um, this is uh, uh, the top 10 uh, high and critical risk uh, network layer vulnerabilities uh, last year. So we can see obviously if we have all of these, we need to fix all of them right because they're bad. But we see the CVSS score is pretty much all 10. So obviously we've limited resources, where do we go? So we use the other data that we have. We can clearly see two are on the CISA Kev list. Let's get those tackled first. And corresponding to that, we've two, they both have two high EPSS scores, 35% there and 97 for the top one. If I had to tell my developers or whoever, or my infrastructure people where to fix stuff, I'd be saying, get those two done first, then we'll move through the rest of the list or prioritize stuff a different way. So I think we just we need to think about moving away from CVSS and leveraging all these other tools that are out there and are fully available. And that's me. I made it in the 15 minutes. Ah. Uh, our stats report is available the next one in the next two weeks or so. Uh, if anyone has any questions for me or anything, I'm, uh, we're out, I'm out at the booth for the we next couple of hours as well. can actually take one question now. Uh, yeah, if I can take one. if we want to do one as well. That's fine. One then. Thoughts as to how you get the uh, risk prioritization that you showed in the last slide. How do you get that aligned with what the industry um, thoughts are from insurers? I know, and compliance frameworks and all of that stuff. I don't know. I think that's a long road, and I think, I think as newer versions of things are coming out, like the newer CVSS versions, I think there needs to be more conversations around adding in that dynamic piece as well. Because you're right, and things like PCI as well, you'd fail a PCI uh, scan if you have anything of a CVSS score of four or, or up, uh, even though half of that stuff mightn't even be useful to fix. Yeah, I know. It's really challenging. I, I'm not even sure where to start with that one. Yeah. <laughs> cool? Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you.